Uh, hello, I'm Ryan Williams. This is more tools and algorithms for genomic analysis on Spark. Um, I gave an earlier version of this talk at Spark Summit East in February. Um, I talked about guacamole, which is a somatic variant caller built on Spark that my lab has been working on for a few years, uh, and a library called Magic RDDs uh, that I've worked on for a bit that has just some interesting implementations of collections uh, algorithms uh, for Spark RDDs. Um, Neither of those is uh, relevant, or sorry, like required to understand anything I'm going to talk about today, but the slides and video for that are online. These slides are also online if you want to follow along at the bit.ly link at the bottom, which is ss17-ryan. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about a coverage depth analysis tool that I, I talked a little bit about last time, but there's been some progress there that is uh, interesting to discuss. Um, a few reflections on some uh, uh, moves from running Spark applications on an in-house Hadoop cluster that my lab maintains uh, versus Google Cloud's infrastructure for uh, running Spark applications. Uh, we've been doing a mix of both, and it's kind of interesting to see the, the trade-offs there. Um, there will be a bit of a deep dive into uh, a, a month of my life that I invested into making BAMs more usable uh, in distributed settings uh, that had some interesting lessons. Uh, and a little bit of discussion of algorithms for uh, distributed suffix array construction at the end that could be uh, relevant to um, genome alignment and assembly problems uh, in the future. Uh, so I work at Hammer Lab, uh, which is uh, at Mount Sinai in New York, uh, also funded by the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. Uh, it's like 12 people, everyone's uh, somewhat computational, and then there's a mix of other biomedical and statistical backgrounds. Um, we have a personal genome vaccine pipeline that's in a clinical trial right now, and uh, a couple more similar trials kind of in the works. Um, it's a, an end-to-end -end computational pipeline that goes from um, sequenced DNA and RNA from cancer patients, uh, normal tissue and tumor tissue, and goes all the way to um, outputting peptides that hopefully when we synthesize and inject into the region of the tumors along with an immune adjuvant can trigger an immune response uh, against the tumor. Uh, so that's uh, pretty interesting. It's all kind of, uh, that pipeline is cobbled together with sort of like existing bioinformatics tools, nothing really novel that we built there in the application level, though the, a lot of the workflow and stuff that we've uh, put together uh, is custom and all that. Almost everything we do is open source and on GitHub. Uh, we do a lot of miscellaneous clinical data analysis, uh, just kind of serving as a computational resource for various clinicians in need from different institutions that we run into. Um, and I'm sort of a long-running background thread at the lab attempting to port some bioinformatics applications onto the Spark stack, um, or the larger Hadoop world, uh, with the goal of kind of uh, speeding them up by parallelizing them, uh, gaining better transparency and auditability uh, from uh, being able to kind of iterate on the algorithms and the tools more quickly when they run faster, et, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a quick overview of like the landscape. There's a few groups that work on uh, the, the general problem of like uh, doing genomic analysis of some kind or another on Spark. Um, the Broad Institute has a lot of efforts in this space. They've been working on the next generation of the uh, sort of ubiquitous GATK suite of tools uh, that's built on Spark for a while. And there's the Hale project, which was presented earlier today uh, for doing sort of population variant analysis at scale on Spark. Um, the AMP Lab has the Big Data Genomics Organization, which has sort of the, uh, a lot of tools at different parts of the stack, many of which are under the Atom moniker, um, and also a, uh, sort of set of Avro schemas. They're sort of aspirational definitions of um, portable uh, genomic record types that could be used, uh, that would uh, be more useful in a lot of settings than the kind of ad hoc uh, formats that we sort of inherited from existing bioinformatics tools. Um, and the Hammer Lab has uh, basically this umbrella of projects uh, called Pageant, which stands for Parallel Genomic Analysis Toolkit that I work on, uh, which includes like this coverage depth analysis tool that I'll talk about in a bit, and also guacamole, which is our um, sort of still nascent somatic variant caller, and a lot of just miscellaneous libraries for, that are genomic specific and also just general kind of Spark uh, related libraries and things like that. Um, so 
Uh, this is a quick uh, screen cap of like some plots that come out of this coverage depth tool uh, that I want to talk about just a bit. Um, what it computes is a joint, hist uh, joint histogram of the coverage depth of one or two genomic read data sets. Um, so like a use case here, like what's being shown is if you have uh, some uh, uh, normal DNA sequencing and tumor DNA sequencing samples from a patient and you want to, uh, maybe, maybe it's like a, an exome sequencing run, you had some loci you were targeting and you were hoping to sequence at a certain depth and you want to know what percentage of the loci, either all the loci in the genome, if it was a whole genome sequencing run, or just what percentage of the loci that you targeted that you actually did sequence uh, and after aligning the reads have ended up with uh, at least a certain depth in the normal sample and a certain possibly different depth in the tumor sample that you feel is required to have sufficient statistical power to say something about what is happening at these sites or whatever. Um, so there's a couple like nice plotly plots that it outputs today and there's like a bunch more stuff I'm hoping to do there. Um, so in this example here, like the plot on the left is showing that for normal depth at least 10 and tumor depth at least 15, 95 and change percent of the whatever capture kit was being applied here was uh, sequenced and had reads mapped to it at at least those two depths in those two samples respectively. Um, okay, so that was all basically true in February, the last presentation of this, so stuff that has happened in the last few months. Uh, on, the, on this piece of software is, uh, and, and several of our other uh, libraries, uh, we've been running more on Google Cloud, uh, whereas we previously exclusively had an in-house Hadoop cluster uh, that we ran on. Um, I'm working on sort of a, like a web-based report with a lot more uh, interesting and interactive plotly plots, uh, something like a next generation kind of multi-QC kind of tool uh, can hopefully come out of that. Um, and there's been some real world use. Uh, my lab collaborated with um, people from Sloan Kettering on this PLOS One publication from earlier this year uh, where they used this coverage depth tool and there's a lung cancer study that's being worked on now where the, that's also using it. And in both cases, uh, the niche that is sort of uh, filling is uh, to help normalize a uh, number of mutations that are observed in cancer samples uh, on like let's say TCGA. Uh, against the number of loci that were sequenced to at least a certain depth that's being deemed as like the minimum sufficient depth uh, for, for that uh, setting. Um, and the effort is, like in both these cases, the, the goal is to identify uh, sort of like ele elevated mutational burden uh, in specific kinds of cancer or after a specific kind of, say, checkpoint blockade treatment. Um, so, uh, yeah, some quick notes about the uh, tale of two infrastructures. Uh, the, our, our Hadoop cluster is called Demeter. It's 100 nodes, 2,400 cores. Um, we bought it four years ago for like a half a million dollars. Um, my boss thinks it would cost about half that now um, because that's how things work uh, in this industry, which is cool. Um, and it sort of comes with uh, some amount of sysadmin allocation that you would need to sort of set up and maintain a cluster of this size. Um, it's served us very well. Uh, it's, we've run a lot of, I mean, all of my like Spark and Hadoop kind of uh, experience came uh, on this cluster and we've uh, had some success running more like uh, HPC style workloads on it. Though that's been a little bit tricky because we've mostly left it um, sort of um, allocated as a Hadoop cluster. Anyway, on the other hand, uh, recently we've been using Google Cloud's data proc offering which is just like it's hosted uh, Spark service. Um, kind of like, it's, it's like some thin wrapper scripts around essentially just standing up a bunch of Google Cloud VMs, uh, having relevant Spark libraries installed on them and some scripts to sort of farm out jobs to that cluster. Um, but it's pretty useful. We basically exclusively use the preemptible node tier, which is like, works out to like two cents per core per hour. Uh, the uh, non-preemptible nodes are like, you know, basically three times that. Um, so, but for our use cases, we mostly just kind of, or at least the kinds of uh, pipelines I've been targeting uh, to keep things sim simple, what I've been trying to do is just like spin up a ephemeral cluster, run a job on it, and then spin down the cluster. And so preemptible nodes are more than fine for that. I don't really need anything persistent on these nodes across uh, runs. Um, you know, it's kind of meaningless uh, back of the envelope numbers here, but just for, for grins, uh, like, you know, if we were to uh, buy a cluster the size that we've had for the last four years, 
at, at these rates, it would cost, uh, you know, I don't know, some like, like three or four times as much as it actually costs us. Of course, the whole point is that, you know, we, we've actually had pretty low utilization, all things considered, like over four years on that cluster. So, you know, more likely if in some alternate universe where Google Cloud's current offerings were available four years ago, maybe that, that would have been cheaper. But um, I think mostly uh, you can kind of just like wave your hands at these numbers and it's like, uh, for almost any size application, like some specific use case is going to want to use one of these approaches more than the other. Um, but yeah, interesting anyway. Um, okay, so some quick notes about a recent, uh, my, my, my colleague Tavi Nathanson ran this coverage depth tool uh, on 1,000 lung cancer, lung cancer BAMs from TCGA. Uh, seemed about 14 gigabytes per BAM, 14 terabytes total. Uh, the goal was, like I mentioned before, just to sort of like uh, analyze what percentage of the ensemble exonic loci had at least a certain depth of coverage in these um, lung cancer samples. Um, so an interesting question we had to answer was sort of how to map from the thousand app Spark applications we wanted to run, one per BAM file, to uh, Google Cloud data proc clusters. This, we, we were determined that we were going to run this on data cloud, any, uh, on data proc, uh, on Google Cloud, uh, rather than our Hadoop cluster, just because uh, we thought we would probably use more than the 2,000 cores available on our in-house cluster. Um, the easiest thing to do would just be to just r take this script that kind of naively spins up a cluster, feeds one Spark job to that cluster, spins it down, and just kind of loop over the 1,000 samples and keep maybe, I don't know, 10 of them in flight at any one time or whatever se seemed like reasonable. Um, you know, doing them all at once would mean spinning up maybe 75,000 preemptible nodes on Google Cloud, which I'm not sure if they would let us do. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty curious if, if they would, but uh, it's, you know, ev every minute is pretty costly at that point in case something's going wrong. So given that this is our first time trying to do something like this, we didn't want to go. Um, we didn't want to quite commit to that level of investment all at once. Uh, so um, the downside of doing it this way is that um, I think there's just like some amount of cluster setup time and cluster teardown time uh, that's like just overhead and it's uh, just spinning up a cluster, running one job on it and spinning it down, I, I thought would have some, some amount of waste in terms of just having the cluster up not actually doing much while we're setting up the Spark app or whatever. And anecdotally running smaller versions of similar jobs uh, parallelizing two or three or five of these applications on one cluster at one time seemed to get like a better than linear kind of like you know, um, work per unit cost uh, ratio out of them. Um, I think that's because like some you know there there are sort of narrower stages that are part of the job where the cluster is not saturated and so if you have a few applications being run at the same time they can kind of fill in each other's slack a little bit. Uh, so we didn't want to do this, even though it would have probably been the easiest thing to do. Uh, the other extreme would be like just one huge cluster and throw all the apps at it. Uh, it has the same problem of like just being kind of a, an intense uh, investment of money per minute uh, for to, to try for the first time. And I was also pretty sure that this wouldn't work very well uh, because uh, the yarn scheduler on the cluster. I, every time I try something, some shenanigans like throwing a thousand jobs at it at once, it just kind of falls over in all kinds of ways, way less than a thousand jobs even. Uh, and also, uh, the driver is doing some work as part of these apps, and if it was one cluster, then there, all the thousand apps are sharing the same driver, and so I, I knew that that would like slow down pretty quickly. So we ended up with this kind of annoying middle ground that was a, sort of the most amount of like spaghetti scripting for this kind of one-off situation, and as, as we do more analyses like this, I'm hoping to get a, a cleaner story about what the best way to, to handle this is. Um, but my colleague Tavi just like spun up 10 like medium-sized data prop clusters that were each about 75 nodes, 300 cores. Um, that's, you know, if you work out, like if these BAMs are like 15 gigabytes and a, a, a Hadoop block split, I mean, th these files are on Google storage, but it, it exposes a Hadoop-like interface and the blocks seem to be about 64 megabytes. So that works out to about 364 megabyte blocks per BAM. So like uh, the, the kind of main stage where we're processing the, the BAMs off of, off of disk if you have 300 cores available, that seems like a, that seemed like a good uh, number to have per app. Uh, so we made our clusters that size, and he sort of carefully, with some scripts, fed like two to five jobs at a, applications at a time to these clusters, uh, and got through them. And it took about six hours, and it was like $400 of uh, you know I don't know 30,000 
well, I guess 3,000 cores, but for, for you know, several hours. And, um, I don't know, that, that was a pretty cool, uh, uh, I guess, uh, utilization of this sort of new a la carte compute uh, model that was uh, um, nice to see work successfully after some years just using our own in-house Hadoop cluster, which is, of course, very inflexibly sized. Um, okay, so uh, there, there was a twist. To, uh, there was a, few, a few of the apps failed when I ran them, uh, or when Tavi ran them, and he, but he was able to resubmit them, and they worked, some transient cluster things just going wrong, who knows. Uh, but two of them would not succeed even on reruns, and I was seeing an error in some downstream read processing in the HTS JDK machinery, which is like the, the Broad Institute's like Java library for dealing with genomic reads and other uh, genomic data types. Uh, and this error is just sort of uh, was disconcerting for a few reasons. I didn't think there <clears throat> should be many unpaired reads in the data set, and I didn't know why if there were unpaired reads they would have some flag that was invalid enough that HTS JDK would be randomly throwing an exception about it. Um, the BAMs seemed to not be corrupt or anything. They seemed fine in SAM tools. So some debugging later, I decided I was getting bad splits uh, out of my, uh, my BAM files. So basically, like, the places that my workers were being dropped into the middle of these files, uh, some of them were just invalid and were reading gibberish data and thinking it was genomic reads. Uh, and this was very disconcerting. Uh, so I did a, a bit of a deep dive on that that I'm going to kind of run through uh, somewhat quickly here. Uh, about how we take a sort of legacy genomic file format, like the BAM format, and we deal with it uh, in a distributed context. So the basic problem of splitting files, uh, independent of any genomics domain uh, applications, is like we imagine we have some huge file in the cloud, it's filled with records, and we can just drop a bunch of machines uh, into different pieces of it, and they'll have like this sort of disjoint and complete partitioning of the whole data set, and every read will be Every record will be processed atomically and exactly once. Um, but that's a little bit tricky because when you are dumping file formats that are not natively like distributed uh, into a block storage distributed system like this, um, it kind of just cuts it up into 64 megabyte chunks. And whatever is on that boundary at 64 megabytes plus one gets put over one so in some other machine somewhere else in the cluster, right? And so you need some. Uh, bit of program logic that will essentially like uh, drop into the you know 64 megabyte plus one offset of a file and kind of figure out where a read where a record boundary is and uh, only start processing from that point onwards and also ship whatever fragment of the end of some record that it has encountered one machine to the left so that that machine can have complete records. Um, that's sort of like the naive way to solve this, and you, some file formats are easier to do this with than others, depending how easy it is to or for a worker machine to orient itself, having just woken up in the, somewhere in the middle of some record, potentially. Um, so Hadoop BAM is this library uh, that a lot of uh, the groups that work in this space depend on in one form or another. Uh, it is and uh, it's, it's an implementation of Hadoop's APIs for just like managing this like uh, splittable file input and output formats. Um, it, was, it was originally implemented many years ago and went through a few paces uh, after that, but as long as I've been looking at these problems for the last like three years, it's been mostly kind of in a state of like stasis and unclear ownership and not really heavy development or maintenance or anything. Um, but every, everybody kind of uses it. Uh, all, all the groups that I described before, I, I think, uh, do essentially. Um, it's, it's kind of like the least robust part of the dependency landscape for, for all of us, uh, probably. Or at least once I realized that there were these bugs in it, I, I learned that that was almost definitely true. Um, but what it does, and usually does well, is it, it, it splits BAM files. It, it, it can just drop into the middle of a BAM file and figure out where your records start. Uh, so just really quickly, I'm going to talk about uh, what that entails. So the BAM format comes from the SAM format, which is a sequence alignment map. It's basically the de facto way that genomic reads are passed around. Uh, you have like a header block that lists what chromosomes are, uh, exist in that file, among other things. And then you have a bunch of like reads, uh, one read per line. Uh, you have a read name, some flags about whether it was mapped or not, what chromosome it mapped to, where in that chromosome it mapped to, some information about how it aligned to the reference or didn't. Uh, and at the end here we have like the sequence of DNA bases, uh, or, or RNA bases, I suppose, uh, that, that constituted the read. Um, so an interesting observation is that I think that the, the SAM format as presented here is sort of naively splittable. If you just like look at new lines, uh, like there's generally just one read per line, and as long as you don't have like 
you know, there's inevitably there's one field at the end of these kind of formats that's like general purpose key value store. Uh, and as long as you don't accept new lines in those kinds of uh, keys or values, then you could probably get away with splitting SAMs pretty trivially. Um, but that's not the problem we're faced with, unfortunately, because we have BAMs. And BAMs take the SAM format, and then they, uh, instead of the sort of like human readable tab delimited one uh, read per line format I just showed, uh, just sort of squishes all the fields together in a binary encoding. Uh, the first field is just like, uh, says here's how many bytes long the rest of this record is, and then it's a bunch of uh, fields of different length, different byte lengths uh, with all that information. Uh, and nothing in there, there's no really like magic bits or anything that helps you like orient yourself uh, super well. And then once you have that binary encoding of the reads, then you block gzip compress it, uh, which is a sort of compression maneuver that, as far as I can tell, was invented for, for, for the BAM format, just to compress SAM files, but in a way that didn't have gzip's undesirable property of where if you want to read any part of a file, you have to decompress the entire file up to that point. Um, block gzip, just gzip's a file 65, 64K at a time. Uh, so 64K of uncompressed data, you just gzip that, and then you gzip the next 64K, and you concatenate those gzip blocks. Um, and the gzip blocks have like a, a four byte magic number at the start of it and some information like about how, how many compressed bytes are about to follow and then the compressed data payload. Uh, so these, these are the three components of the BAM format, I, I guess. Um, and yeah, in, in, in BAMs, we usually get like a factor of three compression over the, the binary encoding, just as, a, as an aside. Um, so to split BAMs, um, First, we have to essentially like unpack the block gzip compression, uh, which if we, if we think about it a bit, we can do. Because uh, if, if, if we land anywhere in a BAM file, uh, what we're looking at is block gzip compressed data. And so we, we can't tell anything about the reads until we get past that. Um, so by looking at the magic, the, the four bytes of magic that appear at the start of a block, uh, we, can, we can basically do this to a reasonable degree of certainty. Um, you scan up to 64K until you see those magic bytes. Uh, if you get unlucky, you might have just seen the magic bytes inside of the compressed data. And so what you probably want to do is then imagine that the four magic bytes you've just seen are indeed the start of a BG, uh, uh, block gzip compressed block. Read the next four bytes or you know, whatever that, that tells you the size of the compressed data. Go that many bytes ahead and make sure there's another bit of magic and then read that size and go that far ahead. And you can go you know, n blocks ahead and basically get like four billion to the n uh, one over that like probability that you've like, that you're being fooled by randomness in the compressed data, um, because because the gzip part of this is like a, a good general purpose compression algorithm. It's essentially random that you would see those four bytes. There's no like systemic biases working against you. Um, so fine. So once we've so our, our workers have landed in the middle of the file, they've found the start of some block gzip blocks. They can uncompress those and start just looking at actual the, the binary read data. Um, so in this, you can't really do that well. Um, as I said before, there's no like magic bytes that you can scan for uh, that tell you when a read record starts. A lot of these uh, fields can be any possible value. That's the number of bytes long that they're designated to be. Um, and a lot of them are, tend to be like uh, values that if you read, interpret them as values for other fields, could plausibly just trick you and make you think that they're okay. You know, there's like a lot of these fields tend to just be lower numbers, even though they're allocated two bytes or four bytes or things like that. Um, so the best we can do is kind of uh, just at every byte offset, we just imagine that we are looking at the start of a read record uh, and we start parsing it and we just try to look for inconsistencies in the fields that would tell us actually, no, we're, we're being fooled here. This is the middle of some record. Let's move over by one byte and start over. Uh, so like the first, the, the second field after the number of bytes long that the record is, is a index, which is which, basically which chromosome is this read mapped to? And that should be an integer that is less than the number of chromosomes. Uh, the, the, the locus on that chromosome should be less than the length of that chromosome, which all of which we know from the header of the, the BAM file, which we can trivial, trivially parse from the first partition. Um, so there's a bunch of rules like this we can apply, and that's what Hadoop BAM has done for all, for all of us for years, and it's uh, done it pretty well, as far as anyone can tell. Um, like the, the length of, there's an integer that's the length of the read name, and then there's the name terminated by a null byte. So if you read the length and you go by that many bytes ahead, you should see a null byte. Um, the name should be reasonable ASCII characters. Uh, the cigars should imply a read length that matches the declared length of the sequence of this read. 
uh, the cigar operators should be one of these nine characters, even though there's uh, four bits allocated for them, so 16 possibilities. Uh, so things like this. Um, so Hadoop BAM has, the, the existing Hadoop BAM has most of those checks already, and yet I was seeing these cases where it was hitting, it, it, was, it was emitting false positives. It was looking at a specific offset and a specific BAM and saying, I think a read starts here, and it turns out that was just the middle of some other read. Uh, so this is like this TCGA BAM uh, at this position, like 260 megabytes in, and then 115 bytes into the compressed block that starts at that position, 268 megabytes in. Uh, we, we have this series of bytes, which is like most of the, 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 the header of the BAM. And there's a BAM record in here, uh, the header of the BAM record. Uh, there's a BAM record. Uh, it starts one byte over from what I've shown on the screen. If we leave out the, the null byte all the way on the left, this is the true BAM record that we wanted to find here. It's 271 bytes long. It maps to the first contig, chromosome one. It, uh, the read is mapped to a position at 24 million something on that chromosome which is fine, chromosome one is like 200 million bases long. Uh, it has no map quality, it's, a, it's an unmapped read. The, length, the read name length is 34 bytes long, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Hadoop BAM was actually just getting stuck one byte prior to this. Uh, it was kind of getting fooled into thinking that this one byte shifted sequence of bytes was a, was a genomic read. Uh, so some of these values, it's just the real value multiplied by 256 because it was, it was like an integer shifted over by four bytes, an integer that was not using its most significant bits. Uh, so, you know, 69,000 bytes long for a read. Like, that seems crazy, but we're starting to have long read sequencing where you have, like, reads that are that long. Um, the reference, it, it's still mapped to chromosome one uh, because there are just enough zeros around that that part didn't shift. Uh, the locus should have been a red flag, so this is something that Hadoop BAM missed. Uh, because it was saying the locus was two billion something when uh, chromosome one, which is a sen it's a sensibly mapped to, is only like 200 million bases long. Uh, so that was sort of a missed opportunity to identify this correctly as a not the start of a read. Uh, the length of the read name was listed as one, and that includes a null trailing byte. So that's essentially an empty string for the read name, which kind of doesn't make sense. So there's a few things here where I was like, oh, if we add some extra checks, we could fix this. Um, so I started fixing it in Hadoop BAM, and then I ended up sort of spinning out my own, like, sort of fork, uh, but actually just separate repository that does BAM splitting differently. Um, so there's, like, just a list of the checks that each one does. I just added in a few that the existing one doesn't do. Um, and this fixes the two BAMs that I found that uh, gave me these issues. Um, so that's good. I was still a little bit disconcerted about, like, whether this has been happening, like, are, are some fraction of the genomic analyses on Hadoop or Spark that all of these groups have done in the last few years uh, just invalid and have been de dealing with uh, corrupt reference read data that wasn't caught by HTS JTK, JDK in the way that my two examples here were? Uh, I don't know, so I wanted to uh, do some more rigorous checking. Uh, so I wrote a, a version of, of this sort of BAM split finder that just like checks brute force every uncompressed position. Uh, of a BAM file that you input and outputs all of the, of the like 17 checks that I've put in there, like which ones uh, occurred how many times, and in particular situations where a, a position truly was not the start of a read and the checker identified it as not the start of the read, but just barely, like only one of the checks failed and all of the other ones were, would have just allowed it to pass. Um, and mostly I'm kind of satisfied that uh, I've, I've got something that, that works now. I might add a few more checks in just to be, uh, just to be safe, but um, uh, so here's just a uh, spark history of the one of these runs happening where I just went over uh, 30 billion uncompressed positions in one of these 10 gigabyte BAMs, uh, got everything correct. Uh, some of the shuffle stages were a bit bigger than uh, I, I thought they should have been, uh, but that's, I don't know, it's sort of just like story of a lot of spark apps uh, that I've dealt with in my experience. Um, I think I'm a little short on time, so I'm gonna have to breeze through the rest pretty quickly. Uh, one other optimization I did is that I, I, found it, I found the split computation in existing Hadoop BAM to be very slow when I was running on Google Cloud. Uh, it's taking like four minutes for some of these uh, BAM files. Uh, it seemed to be due to slow Google Cloud storage round trips, and the driver was just computing all these splits in sequence. Um, so I wrote a parallel version that just uses a bunch of threads on the driver to kind of uh, be doing work while the network I.O. is blocking. Uh, and that sped everything up uh, dramatically, so that, that part takes like eight seconds now with that optimization. 
Uh, I used up to like 32 threads that seemed to be fine before the driver would start to suffer it was on like a 24 core machine. And then with some of the other checking infrastructure I showed a second ago, I, I wrote like another version of this uh, where I actually use a Spark job to have, uh, have the driver send the block offsets to worker machines, have them find the record offsets in uh, the, the splits and send those back to the driver. And so there's some fixed, fixed costs of having like doing, using a Spark, instantiating a Spark job for this over the, just the threaded version I mentioned a second ago. Um, but I think on really big BAM files, it might actually be uh, pretty useful to be able to do it this way. Um, so popping up the stack a little bit, like do we, should, should is this a, maybe should we not be using BAMs given these vagaries? Uh, VCFs are a similar kind of analogous like genomic format that has not aged well with a lot of the distributed computations we want to do. And it seems like people are moving to uh, different models of representing variant data. Um, BAMs seem a little bit more robust. It, uh, I think partly maybe due because, uh, due to the fact that we have these tools that seem to be like good enough at letting us work with them in distributed context. So it seems like they're sticking around. I think that in a world where long reads are more prevalent, uh, that's, they, they might stress the BAM format a little more. Um, and so that might provide some impetus for moving away. And also all the existing outliners, out, uh, aligners output uh, BAMs. So a lot of these tools are just stuck with what they get upstream from aligners. Uh, so it would be nice if we had a distributed aligner. That was something that Matei was trying to do around the time he was creating Spark and maybe even use Spark for that. So it's kind of an old problem, but nobody's really done it as far as I can tell. Uh, at this re repository, I have some algorithms for building data structures that are useful for genome alignment and assembly. Uh, they're very much works in progress and it's a little unclear how, we, how to use them in a distributed environment because you kind of have to do a lot of random seeks to align reads uh, to other reads or to a reference using these data structures. Um, so uh, that's an area of research. Um, so just finishing up here, uh, I think in the near future we'll be, I'll be publishing a, a bunch of these tools uh, under the, the pageant moniker and uh, Guacamole's sort of flagship uh, variant caller will be part of that. Uh, making them all work for long reads is going to be really interesting, and that's all. So, quite over time, but thank you, and I'll take questions now if we have any time. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Uh, we won't have time for the uh, for, for questions now, but the speaker will probably be around for the next yeah, few minutes. Around, I'll hang around. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Thanks. Thank you.